Hi, I'm Sarah Stratton, and I'm an animator for Reconciliation and Indigenous Justice at the United Church of Canada. We're in Sudbury, Ontario, to mark the 30th anniversary of the apology from the United Church to First Nations peoples. And we're having a conversation about that moment and the future of the apology and reconciliation in the church with some key players from 30 years ago and today. Joining me today are Alberta Billy, who on behalf of Native Ministries told the United Church of Canada that it owed Native peoples an apology. The very Reverend Bob Smith, former moderator of the United Church, who delivered the apology 30 years ago in August 1986. Pam Hart, who's a layperson from Bay of Quinte Conference, very involved in right relations work, and Lawrence Sankey, the vice chair of the church's Aboriginal Ministries Council. We're going to be talking now about what the apology means to them as individuals and as members of the United Church of Canada. So good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we're just going to have a brief conversation among ourselves and, and just going to throw a few questions out for you. Um, the first is really to reflect on what the apology means to you personally or what significance you feel it has personally. And I think Alberta would like to begin with you. For me personally, I had no idea I was going to do that. It happened. We were at General Council Exec that years ago. And I think we were the first Native people ever to be in that place. And we were, people were looking at us like, who let you in the door? Where did you come from? But the night before we were to speak, Stan and Thelma and I got together to have a conversation about uh, what we were going to talk about the next day. And we really didn't discuss anything. We just, I said, well, there was a book that the United Church had promised to do for the Native people. So I checked list them and they hadn't done anything as far as Dan knew. And so I said, well, I'll go last. You guys go ahead first. And that's how it went. And when we were done, I said to them, I think I'm going to ask the church to apologize. And Thelma said, why? And I looked at Stan, and he was kind of smiling. He said, if you think that's what you have to do, go ahead. That was it. That was the plan. So the next day, I was in front of all these learned people with degrees behind their names. I made up a few for myself. <laughs> I wanted to be part of that uh, realm of scholars. <laughs> right. I had a MTD. I was the mother of three daughters, but I had also a WF. I was a wife and friend to my husband. My most important degree was I was an FP. I was a Fisher person. And uh, we went over this the list and I said at the end, Bob was sitting beside me like you are, I think the United Church owes the Native peoples of the Americas an apology. I heard from Bob and he said, oh my God. I didn't. You did. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. And for me personally, it meant I understood what my grandfather told me when I was a little girl. He said, you, God has a purpose for you, but we don't know what it is yet. Then I realized that was my purpose, to do this. I think if we had discussed it, I wouldn't have done it, but it happened. And to me personally, it meant we were already spiritual people. We did not have to be Christianized. We had spirituality in the connection with the Creator and the land. So personally, it was important because the church had done a lot of criminal things to our people, especially in residential school. That was how it was personally. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Bob. 
as the man who had to answer up to that on behalf of the church a year later. Well, uh, I think a, a preamble. Um, mm -hmm. The United Church has been, I have been part of the United Church all my life. I was the son and grandson of United Church ministers. And, uh, and so as a little boy in Hamilton and Brockville where I lived, uh, I, I knew about the, the wonderful work that the church was doing in places like Arrows and Bella Coola and places like that. And, and the missionaries would come to the church and would talk and we gave our pennies. So, and my father at one point was chair of the Board of Home Missions, so I knew all about the, the work as I, as I grew up and as I became a young minister. So I knew a lot about what, what we were doing. Uh, I have to say that it changed my life, and it changed my life uh, in particular because I had no idea what we were doing. And, and, and the, the, the thing that uh, has, has become what I remember most was that at the end of the apology, after I read it to the crowd, there was weeping and silence, and, and, and the silence was broken by Art Solomon, who, who said, now, what in the hell are they going to do about it? And so the rest of my active ministry, and, and in, a, in a way that my whole life has been trying to do what Art challenged me and the church to do. Yeah. And Pam, you're now trying to do that work as well as a, a member of the Right Relations work, Working Group in, in Bay of Quinte. And what does the apology mean to you in the context of that, of that work that you've been so engaged in? Well, if I'm allowed, I'll go back to what it meant when I heard about the apology. Because um, one day in November in 2009, I was invited to a dinner in Curve Lake. And I was invited late in the afternoon. It was a very last minute invitation. And that invitation and going to Curve Lake for dinner triggered a memory in me that I hadn't thought about. We don't want to talk about how many years since I'd thought about it. Um, but it was a memory of when I was in either grade five or six. And my Sunday school teachers, I grew up in the United Church too, in Hamilton. And uh, my Sunday school teachers had planned a mission Sunday. And there were different stations. And one of the stations, I don't remember a lot of the stations, but the one that I really remember was the one about sending teachers and nurses to residential schools. And I don't know what triggered me, but I became incensed. I was absolutely inflamed with anger that my church, who had taught me to sing Jesus Loves the Little Children, all the children of the world, would send kids and divide them from their parents. I was really mad. But what really put me over the top was the fact that we had taken their spirituality away from them which I knew a little bit about from some books and poetry that had been read to me. But we had taken their spirituality, and then we didn't let them spend Christmas with their parents. I just thought that was so unlike everything that my church was trying to teach me about, that I was angry at the church, and I was angry for them doing that. And when I started thinking about that memory, um, by the time I got to Curve Lake for dinner, I was really ready for that sharing circle that we had later. And it, it, I, it reminds me of the, the training book that, that the United Church has out in one of the chapters is um, the danger of denial and, and the something of lament. Uh, anyway, that sharing circle helped me lament what that memory from long ago and that's what put me on the track of mm -hmm. and so 
when I heard about the apology, it kind of made me proud again of the church that now they were at least trying to make some amends. You've both pointed to, we, we knew what the church was about, but of course there's a, there's a whole part of the church that we as the non-Indigenous church didn't, didn't really understand, even though we really believed we understood it, we grew up in it our entire life, or we were so formed by our Sunday school experiences. And that apology was um, the asking for the apology or the, the telling for, of the need for the apology and the apology itself was really a way of breaking a lot of that open for many people. Lawrence, your thoughts? First of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to be sitting here with such distinguished people, um, especially to you for stepping up and taking that stand to represent each and every one of us. I am deeply honored. And what the apology means to me in this day and age is unification. Is the first word that popped in my head when I was talking to you earlier. It, as the United Church of Canada and the apology that came forth, it unified the First Nations and the United Church of Canada so much more. And when I was asked to step in as the reverend for the Lock for Lambs band, uh, when an elder, when two elders approached me, a Jack White and a, a, predeceased, a deceased Wayne Ryan, um, they both came to me and asked me to, if I'd like to open the church on Sundays. That's how I started. And they went into a little bit more detail than that. They told me the background of the residential school issue and how they understood it and what I was going to be walking into. <clears throat> and they both looked at me and they said, you look like you're well educated. You look like you can handle yourself in this regard. I did not say yes to them right away. I just said, OK. <clears throat> I've got to talk to my family because um, anything I do, my family, my wife and my son and daughter and my grandchildren play a huge role in it. Mm -hmm. Even when I leave town to come here, mm -hmm. I have to discuss with them as to what I'm going to be doing and how long I'll be gone. And so unification is the word that came to me and that's, you know, that's the big step. And like I said earlier, I'm greatly honored to be with you all as the new generation representative. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. So what about, I mean, unification, um, different relationships? Um, what has the, what do you all think the apology has done in terms of shifting or changing the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in the church? I think like Lawrence mentioned, unification is stronger. But like everyone here, I grew up in the church as well yeah. as a little girl. And every Saturday night, we got prepared to go to Sunday school and church. But um, I think the apology has um, for instance, with Pam, made her aware of a lot of things she didn't know. You know, like, um, I used to, we were fortunate in our village. We had wonderful United Church ministers that came, and they all taught me something, mm -hmm. you know, and I respected them. But at the same time, my granny said, don't forget your song. Don't forget your dance. Don't forget your language. Don't forget your name. Don't forget where you came from. They called themselves Christian people, but they were still very much into 
spirituality and culture. To me, that meant stronger than the church had to offer us. That's why I wanted to be accepted for who I was and for who we all are as indigenous peoples all over the world. And do you feel that you are, do you feel that the apology has made a difference to that? I think so because, um, you know, when I was at General Council of Zach, I didn't know there were rules and regulations. I didn't know he had to have a resolution. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. And we didn't talk about it, but because it happened that way, I think it was more profound. I remember the reaction of the people in the room. The older people who had been in the church for years were like really angry that I dare say that. Right. Uh, the younger people were very curious. They wondered why I said that. I looked at Thelma and she just was looking at me like, you did say it. And Stan was smiling. So, you know, I think, and then we had lots of conversations after with people all over the country. In my own church, we have the button blanket that covers the communion table. We have a rare this wall that has the cycle of the salmon done by Bill Reed mm -hmm. and his uh, John Hart. And it represents not only the cycle of the salmon, but also of our lives because we are salmon people. So it not only affects the native people, the non-native people who come to our church can relate to that as well. So that's a part of us. The other thing in our church is the stained glass window that my mom had made someone make for her in memory of my grandparents. And it depicts the, um, the boat on the tumultuous water. And for the mass, it's a cross. Mm. But it shows in the painting all the hoops and structures and everything that we have to go through when we're on the water. How we need to respect that. But we have to live like that. And to me, that means we need to live in harmony with each other. I do a workshop now with Kathy. Kathy Camilleri. Kathy Camilleri, yeah. the United Church um, got her to come all across Canada with it. And in that uh, structure, we, um, we construct a village. It's what we had before contact. And we had it right. So, you know, um, we educate so many people in the schools, in the hospitals, in the ministry. Kathy works for the Ministry of Youth and Children. Doctors, lawyers, hospital people, you know, it's amazing. So that's about all I can think of right yeah. now. It's a long story. And some of that comes from the fact that attitudes changed because of the apology. Mm -hmm. I think so. And people I think so sat much. up and listened mm -hmm. when you spoke. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Other thoughts on how the relationship has changed, how you've seen the relationship change? Well, I, I think the first thing to say is that it has changed glacially. Mm -hmm. That uh, there was, I think the response that I picked up in those early years was curiosity that, that we should do this. Um, by the time of the General Council, uh, all of the 380 commissioners who were there, as well as the a couple of hundred other staff and, and support people uh, had 
been exposed to the preparatory studies that had gone out, and we knew a lot about the history. We didn't have a real picture of what colonialism was. We didn't have any real pi We had no idea of what was buried under the, under the whole label of the residential school. Yeah. No idea. But as, as in, in British Columbia in particular, we were, we were uh, it, was an, it was necessary for the church to deal directly with, the, first of all, the criminal trials, the Blackwater criminal trials of uh, the Alberni, of, of what had happened, and then the years of, of civil litigation over whether the church was, was vicariously responsible and therefore owed reparations. Right. And then at that, that has profoundly affected the, British, the church in British Columbia, our awareness of what happened in our midst uh, generations before. The other thing that, that, was so, that we are aware of, and, and, and those of us who were involved with the General Council, was the extraordinary work that was done by staff in, in, uh, at every level of the General Council directly to influence the other churches and in particular to, to hold the, the government of Canada uh, to account. And the, the end result of that extraordinary effort that happened under the surface, and, and there were other people making the same effort as there were in the United Church, was the uh, the decision that produced the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and now all of Canada, we know, two thirds of the people in Canada have an understanding that something happened there. Yeah. So it's it's it's, it's still a glacial effect in the little congregations who don't want to hear any more about this. We've they've heard too much already. Yeah. But it's got to go on because. The work of reconciliation has only just begun. Yeah, I have to say as a staff person, um, one of the things I always think about is there are going to be many people out there who think the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has done, you know, we've apologized mm -hmm. in 86, we apologized again in 98, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So that, so that piece of work is done. and. It's like, no, um, that piece of work has begun again. <laughs> it's work that we have to keep doing and keep doing. And I think that phrase, glacial pace, is, uh, is appropriate. I think some people have made that change, um, made that shift uh, more quickly than others. Um, and I think much of that is, is represented in the Right Relations Network. Um, groups and churches across the country who are doing work on reconciliation and building right relationships. And I just wondered, Pam, if there was something you wanted to say about, about that, um, about the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous in the church from that perspective. Well, I've had the privilege of meeting many First Nations people since 2009 when I started. Um, but I tend to work more with trying to educate the people in the pews right. who are not or have not uh, claimed to be First Nations. And it's a hard sell with many of them. Yeah. Um, they have lots of questions. They have lots of biases. Um, and one of the wonderful tools that I have is a quilt that was made by uh, an ecumenical group in Peterborough. And it's their reflections after hearing the stories about residential schools. And I can go into groups and tell stories. And that really connects. And I've just started going into um, elementary schools. And I think that's where we really need to work because they just soak it up. And they don't see a big deal. Um, they have lots of uh, people with other shades of skin in their classes, some of them. and. They just don't know why there would have been a problem, except they do not understand how we could take children away from their mommies and daddies, and they get that that was wrong. Yeah, I just did uh, 
last week with a, a group of youth who came to general counsel office. Um, I did a blanket exercise, which is an experiential history exercise um, developed by Kairos, our, our ecumenical partner. And this was a group of kids from about 14 to 18, and one of them said at the end of it, I just don't really understand why people think it's appropriate to have done that. <laughs> and can someone explain that to me? And the general secretary and I both just sat there, and it was silence, and she finally said, I, I can't explain that to you. I can't explain that to you. And, uh, and that's, to me, that's a part of what the relationship is now between Indigenous and non-Indigenous in the church, and I hope in Canada, is that trying to learn what happened and trying to move forward from what happened into something, into something different. So I think that's a crucial part of who we are. Lawrence, any thoughts on that one before we move on? Uh, like I stated earlier, unification has done so much for us in, in a matter where I can now unite with each and every one of you. Um, and it's not just myself, it's our elders have opened up that door also where they feel more openly towards each other rather than staying bottled up and sitting in a corner to ourselves. I can walk into anyone's service and I'll be greeted. Uh, anyone's meeting and I'll be greeted. Coming here yesterday I was greeted phenomenally by each and every one of you. And that's what it means. Um, that's what it has done for us so far. And as you stated, moving forward from that, you know, it just closing those doors and opening up new ones is the big step in it all. So, yeah. I just add to um, how can that happen? How could that have happened? We had, as indigenous peoples all over the world, we had a governing system that was so powerful, it scared the government, it scared the non-native people, and it scared some ministers. The governing system we had stemmed from the family. The children were the most important, up to the highest hereditary chief. He had followers like Jesus did. He had his disciples. We also had that with our hereditary chief. He had counsel. Our governing system maintained our whole lifestyle. That's who we were before contact. And that was too powerful. Yeah. We still have the values, so we need to go back to them. And that's a really important part of, of of what was said in the apology. We were apologizing as a church for um, how we treated those values, how we abused those values and didn't honor them. Um, which leads me to the last question for discussion. If, if we want, 30 years on, we're in Sudbury, 30, again, 30 years on, we have had a second apology and we have had um, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, the United Church of Canada has committed to living out the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That's the context we're in now. It's a new context. It's a moment that I think we all know in our hearts we have to seize because it's not going to come again. What do we have to do in that context to really make the apology real? to live out the, if the United Church really wants to be honest to the apology that was made here 30 years ago, what do we have to do? I really believe that the church has to accept us. We are indigenous to the land from the creator. We had a way of life that was very spiritual. We had thanksgiving for everything the food from the ocean, the food from the forest. We lived with the land. And we need to pursue those values again. We cannot go back 
to the past. We can remember. And we remember lots of things now because the older people are coming out. They're talking about their life, what they did. When I was a little girl, I saw them. I watched them. I heard what they said, but I also listened. I was surrounded by old people that were so wise, so intelligent, so spiritual. They guided my life. When my grandfather said that to me, I didn't know what he meant. I had no idea what he meant. I may have been only eight or nine, but I never forgot it. Yeah. I never forgot it. It was always in my heart. And I think the church made a step in the right direction. We still aren't up to par. Our people still live in poverty all over this country. Our kids are committing suicide. They're lost. They don't understand what happened. They don't understand why we are drenched in alcohol and drugs. They don't understand a lot of things. And 30 years ago, my cousin Bobby Joseph and I talked about this. And we were told not to talk about it by our own people. Mm. Don't talk about that residential school. Are you talking about my friend Bobby Joseph? My cousin. I didn't know he was oh. your cousin. <laughs> trouble, trouble, man. trouble. Well, that's why we're related. <laughs> we worked together in the band office in Cape Mudge. Her mom, Kita, her mom was only two years old at the time. Huh. So, you know, I think the church is probably doing the best they can. We have so many Native ministers now, and I'm proud of them. Um, I look at the audience of people in our circle. Their children are following suit, like you grew up in the church and I did. Their children are becoming ministers. Their children will probably follow the steps in the church. So we have that respect, but we also need to know there we are accepted for who we are, for all our ceremonies, because they're healing. They're healing ceremonies. Otherwise, we wouldn't do them all over the country and all over the world. I think the apology probably came at the right time, like we don't have schedules for anything. Sometimes they just happen. And we need to carry it on because it's an ongoing process. Other thoughts on what the church needs to do? Well, well it seems to me that, that, the, that the church in this critical period as we as we deal with diminished funds, uh, diminished numbers, increasing age of the people who are still left, that, that, if, that we have two choices, and one is to try to preserve the church. The other is uh, to remember that our primary purpose, I think our primary purpose in being here is to be working with God for the healing of all creation. And, and if we lose sight of that, any, anything that we spend on trying to preserve the institution is uh, simply wrong. So uh, I, have no, I have no idea what the church is going to look like in 30 years. I believe that there will be people of the Christian faith and of all faiths and of all goodwill in the, in the world who will be trying to work on that task of healing. The healing that happens within our communities is where we have to begin, but we have to have a much bigger picture of the task. 
So, 30 years from now, well, oh, well, we'll, well, we'll have different things to say then, won't we? We'll, we'll have be, to check in again. We'll be uh, checking up on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't doubt that. <laughs> 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 Pam and Lawrence, any sort of closing thoughts on that? Just, I think that uh, the church, general council, head offices, the conference offices have done so much. But where we need action now is the people in the pews. And we need to address the racism that still sits in the pews and encourage them to see the history and to see the value in First Nations culture and spirituality. Lawrence. I just picked up on one of the words which you mentioned on racism in the pews, which is, um, I dislike that word, period. <laughs> Sorry to say, but um, when, I met, when I mentioned unification, I, I, that, above, that pretty much overcame all that. And um, I, I, when I stand behind the pew and I preach a sermon, I preach the love of God. I preach the love of the people, and I send it forth. And I, you know, I send them out into the world, and I tell them to spread the love of God out there, um, no matter who they come up against or who they talk to, whether they're black, white, Asian, First Nations, no matter where they come from, this part of the world, in this whole world, I teach the love of God on it all. And that's what I, that's what I get out of the apology, where it started, is from the love of God through a loving elder. That's what I see in all this. And going forward, I'll continue to preach the love of God. I'll continue to listen to my elders and what they say and do and tell me and guide me along the way. And that's why, that's why I agreed to join. That's why I talked to my family first because I'm not in this alone by a long shot. I'm in it with everybody from one, and one coast to the next. So and my family's involved in it. If I step out of line and I say something out of turn, my wife pulls me aside and she sits me down and she talks to me. She says, you need to reword your thoughts on that one. And that she usually asks me before I go up, before I come out and say something, what are you gonna say? I don't know, I'm gonna say what comes to my heart. I'm gonna pray about it and I'm gonna ask God for help. And she says, well, just stop and think a moment before you say it, and then you'll, it'll come out right. So I listened to her very carefully. And my dad, uh, who passed away a few years ago, he's also another one that got me into this. I used to sit at home watching sports. He went to the feasting, and he would never say, are you going to go? He'd look at me. Get your things on, we're going. Just like that. And that's the kind of leadership I loved. It wasn't, you want to come along with me? It's, we're going. And he just took me along and he followed me. And then later on, his First Nations name, he passed it on to me, Pila, uh, which means um, high above the clouds from my Eagle Clan. So, so yes. Uh, Loving all of it is what I got. I like that phrase, leadership by let's just get up and go. And that sounds a little bit to me like a charge to the church 30 years after the apology. Let's just get up and go. <laughs> and I often wondered, do things happen in 30 year spans? Mm. Maybe, maybe not. Well, we'll, we'll, see. we'll check in in 30 years. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all for being with us. It's really, as Lawrence said, an honor to be with you all. And, um, and we have a, a big day ahead of us here to mark 
uh, what happened 30 years ago. And I'm glad that we're able to share this with uh, the broader community who wasn't able to join us here in, in Sudbury. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir.